Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. So welcome to another episode of Christian uh, Theology. Uh, today I wanted to continue uh, this talk, these different videos that I've done about um, Calvinism and about the Reformed theology and why, uh, in my opinion, you know, in my view of what the Bible teaches, it's inconsistent, incoherent, and uh, contradictory with biblical truths, with clear biblical truths, such as the free will of man or the moral responsibility that human beings have for the choices that they make. So if a human being rejects God, or if a human being accepts the gift of God uh, and has faith in God, well, these two things, because they are conscious and completely free choices, they carry out certain consequences and certain responsibility, in a sense. And God is plain, uh, in my opinion, in the, in the Bible, he is plain to see how and why God, in a certain way, holds us responsible for how we react to his grace, for how we react to what he has provided and how he has uh, saved us, in a sense, or has offered to us the gift of salvation. But it's up to us if we decide to accept it or not. And depending, because it's a free, conscious choice, of course, this encompasses that if we reject it, then we are held responsible for rejecting God, for rejecting his gift of salvation. And in the same sense, if we instead believe in it and we accept it and we receive it, we are held responsible and we are rewarded for having done that. See? So, like, the both the reward and the consequence, the punishment, the judgment for accepting or rejecting God's offer of salvation would make no sense if it's God that ultimately uh, foreordains and decrees whatsoever comes to pass, including those who are going to be saved and those who are not going to be saved. If God chooses some people called the elect and those people are going to be saved no matter what, and instead God passes over his grace or just doesn't uh, care or reprobate about the rest of human beings and they stay in the rebellious state where they can't do anything other than continually keep on rejecting God. So there is an genuine offer of salvation. There is, the genuine, there is an offer of salvation only to the elect because only the elect are regenerated by God and are given the ability, according to Calvinism, to be, in, be, in, be even able to repent and to believe. Um, so I hope I laid down pretty much the Calvinist framework pretty easily. I have um, different videos about that. And today, what I'm going to do is I wanted to show you a very common, a famous passage that Calvinists use to support their tulip, so the five points, the five doctrines of Calvinism, and, uh, um, and how they interpret it. And instead, I'm going to sh sh share with you a non-Calvinist interpretation of Ephesians 1, and why, in my opinion, the non-Calvinist interpretation actually makes a lot more sense, not only in terms of contextual coherence, but in terms of total coherence. So a non-Calvinist interpretation of Ephesians 1 allows us to be coherent with the rest of scriptures. And that is what I'm going to try to show you. Remember, it's very important when we approach the biblical text to have clear principles and have a good hermeneutical approach. Calvinists, many times, they, um, they boast about you know, knowing the Greek or going to the text or exegeting it properly, or you know, making everything in context, and I you know laying out the uh, the authorial intent, what's called the authorial intent, and uh, and so forth. So the Calvinists tend to show themselves as being very good with hermeneutics, with the hermeneutical approach to the biblical text. But what really um, makes me sad sometimes is to hear either friends or people online that. You no, know, seem to be very knowledgeable about the Bible, about the Greek, or about you no know, context and about hermeneutics, and then do very, very basic mistakes in their interpretation, in their approach to the text, and like inserting their own presuppositions on the text, and especially when the text uses certain words, which we're gonna take a look today in the uh, Vision Chapter One, especially keywords such as election, such as uh, predestination and such as salvation, such as faith, grace. Now, all these words in Calvinism have multiple meanings, 
So like cabinets have different meanings of these words and, uh, and they have a very specific um, usage. They always refer to the same thing. They always refer to this, to the sovereignty of God for ordaining and decreeing whatsoever comes to pass before the foundation of the world. God having already established and determined whatsoever comes to pass, including the people that are going to be saved and including those that are not going to be saved. So let's take a look at the passage here. Uh, especially it's going to be verses 4 and 5 and then verse 11 that Calvinists use a lot. But I'm going to try to read all of them from verse 3 until verse 14. So the whole uh, paragraph, pretty much. And he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now I want you to pay attention, especially to the in Christ. So how all these things that Paul is going to list are always linked and conditioned to being in union with Christ, to being united in Christ by the believer, of course. Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of our purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So that's verse 14. And uh, now why did I made you pay specifically attention to how many times in Christ, in him is used? Because as I said before, all these things that Paul is, so the fact that we have been chosen, so we are elected, this is a very Calvinist word, very specific Calvinist word that means that refers to the fact that God has elected, has chosen those who are going to be saved. So every time that a Calvinist reads this, reads God choosing, God electing, God elect, the elect, he automatically assigns to this verb the idea of salvation. So election to salvation. That's, the, uh, that's how the Calvinist reads the text. But remember that this choosing is actually conditioned by being in Christ. Everything that we have read is, is conditioned by being in union with Christ. So in a sense, if we are not in him, we are not chosen. See? So until we are in Christ, we are not chosen. All right? Now let's continue. So what is this choosing that God has done? The fact that he has chosen us in Christ, in him, before the foundation of the world. So it's something that God has already established, in a sense. God has decreed, God has uh, determined, right? We could use these words, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So this is what God has chosen us in him to be. All right? I want you to pay attention here because it's important to which words the election, in this case, is being referred to. So God has chosen us in Christ to be holy and without blame before him. And then having predestined us, and again, this predestination is linked to this act of choosing us in Christ. So he has predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. So again, this predestination is to what? To salvation? No, it's to adoption. And we're going to take, and I'm going to try to show you why this is a very key, important thing that we shouldn't overlook. 
we shouldn't just assume that, well, when the Bible says predestined to adoption, it means, yeah, predestined to be saved and therefore to be sons of God. They are different terms because Paul could have be, be, used the term predestined us to salvation, right? He could have used those words. So if Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, didn't, then that means that he has a, a meaning, a certain um, definition to the word predestination that we should, should not miss or we should not overlook. All right. And, and again, all this is according to the good pleasure of his will. So it's something that God has purpose in himself, according to his own will, that is good. So it's something good that God has done. It's something that God thought and did because it was good. Remember that his will in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says that his will is good, pleasurable and perfect. So and we might be able to know that will. When we renew our mind, we will let the Spirit renew our mind and we are not conformed to the world. And again, always to the praise of the glory of His grace. So again, it's just to show uh, to everybody, right, the glory of His grace. And remember, when the Bible talks about grace, it talks about something that is not deserved. So the fact that God has loved us, right, the fact that God has chosen us in Christ, God has predestined us, to adoption, that God has chosen us in Christ to be holy and blameless. All this is to the glory of His grace, is to just show how much He is giving us all these things for free. He didn't have to do it. God did it out of His great love for us. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says that the greatness of God's love is shown in that Christ died for us when we're still sinners. So when we're still far from God, we were disobeying God, we were uh, rebellious against God, that's when Christ came and died for us. And this just shows how much God loves us and the extent of His grace. And again, by which, by which grace He made us accepted in the beloved. And once again, this made us accepted many times is referred to the fact that, yeah, now we are part of God's family. God has chosen us and therefore God has accepted us. But again, this being accepted is actually, once again, conditioned by being in the beloved. If we are not in the beloved, we are not made accepted. We can't be accepted by God. All right. Now, if we just keep going, verses from 7 to 10, these are verses that normally Calvinists do not really... Um, like Calvinists and non-Calvinists do not really disagree that much on the interpretation because, of course, in Christ we have redemption. So we um, we are redeemed. Redeemed, remember, means to be bought back. So that means that we had something that we lost because of our sin, because of our rebellion against God. We lost that thing that God gave to us, but then God bought it back again to us. And that is why we are redempted by God. We are redeemed by Him. We are redeemed through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And this is what uh, accomplishes redemption for us, the forgiveness of sins, right? According, once again, to the riches of His grace. So how great His grace is, which He made, so which, again, grace, made to abound. So His grace has riches. And not only that, He made His rich grace to abound towards us. And again, this us is very important. This us is actually the believers that are in Christ. So this is the us, is those who are in Christ. And that's why they are getting all these spiritual blessings that come from being in union with Christ. These are all consequences, in a sense. These are all rewards that we obtain by being in Christ. In all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the, the mystery of his will. So this, uh, again, uh, the mystery of his will is something that it was unknown until Christ came. But when Christ came, he made us, he, he revealed himself and he made us know the mystery of his will. So it's not anymore a mystery. It was a mystery, but now this has been revealed. And if you read through 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you can know uh, even more that this mystery now is finally revealed, has been revealed to us. And even here in Ephesians, it explains this mystery. So this is not anymore a mystery, as sometimes you hear Calvinists say. 
his will is not any more mysterious. It's plain to see now. It has been revealed. And what is that will? Right? Again, the good pleasure which you purpose in himself. So this, uh, um, this good thing that God has established to happen, that this is the mystery of his will. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. So again, everything is linked and conditioned to being united in Christ. Both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. And this is the mystery of his will. The fact that we are all going to make one in Christ. We all become one body, right? We all become one in Christ. And then verse 11, once again, a verse that Calvinists uh, use a lot. Once again, it starts, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And once again, the, the fact that we obtain an inheritance is conditioned by being in him. And then Paul uses again the same word they used a couple of verses earlier, in verse 5, predestination, predestinus. In this case, before it was predestined to adoption. Now is predestinus to, well, having obtained this inheritance, there is a predestination to this inheritance, and also to the praise of his glory. So he has a predestination that we who first trusted in Christ will be to the praise of his glory. And once again, so this predestination is linked, is uh, conditioned by trusting in Christ and therefore to the praise of his glory. So once again, is to glorify God, is to show the great mercy and the great and the grace and the love that God has towards us. And again, here the predestination is according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So here that means that God, nothing is outside of God's control. Nothing happens that God doesn't know, right? God knows perfectly well everything that's going to happen. God is omniscient. And this verse just highlights the fact that this good pleasure which he purpose in himself, this good purpose that he has in himself, made him to work all things. So even the things that we sometimes do as bad or evil, God is using them, is working them um, according to his will, right? To what he wants to accomplish to his purpose, right? And for example, this is clear in Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, we can see how God used Israel's rebellion and uh, rejection of Jesus as the Messiah to actually accomplish his plan of redemption and salvation. Right? This is God working all things according to the counsel of his will. God knowing, foreknowing that Israel will reject the Messiah and God using that and working with that to accomplish his salvation. See? The, how God works all things according to the counsel of his will for his purpose. And, uh, and again, this is just the, uh, the verse. And then in verse 13, this is again something that sometimes Calvinists overlook, but uh, it's very, very important because this is how Paul concludes everything. And then he says, uh, because here Paul says in verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And then Paul says, in him you also trusted. It's implied, not trusted, because it's the same verb. Yeah, if you go to the Greek. Uh, so here Paul is talking about sometimes us in terms of Jews, right? We Jews who first trusted in Christ, because remember, not all Jews, not all Israel rejected the Messiah. His, Jesus' disciples, other people that followed Jesus, they accepted him as Lord and Savior. And those who started to convert and become Christians after Jesus had risen because of the preaching of the apostles, also they came to trust in Christ. And remember that at the beginning, it was all Jews. Then, as the uh, gospel started to be preached, they started to become more and more people. Then the Jews, some Jews, started to oppose it and started to uh, not like it anymore. And that's when the apostles started to, to go around and to start preaching also to the Gentiles, so to those who were not Jews. And also the Gentiles, they accepted the, uh, the gospel and they became Christians. And that's where uh, Paul is writing here, because Paul is writing to the Ephesians. And so Paul says, we, so the first Jews, you know, the apostles in a sense, 
or we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of the glory. And then you also, so even you Gentiles, you of the church of Ephesus, even you, no, also you trusted in him after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So again, what, what it is that saves is hearing the gospel of salvation and not only hearing, but also believing in it, trusting in it in Christ, right? That is the center of the gospel. It says, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So this is very important. If you go to the Greek, this is even more clear that the verbs right here have a certain time connotation. So is his first hearing the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, believing it, and then being sealed. So it's like a process. His first hearing, believing, trusting, and then being sealed. All right? It's not like you are first sealed and then, or like you are regenerated by the Spirit, you are enabled to hear, you are enabled to have faith and to believe, and then you believe. According to Ephesians chapter 13, it's actually the opposite. First, you hear the word, you believe in it, and then you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Then you are regenerated, then you are born again. And this is something that contradicts entirely Calvinist theology. Because according to the T of Calvinism, total depravity or total inability, human beings are born in a state where they are unable to believe. They are unable to repent. They are unable to believe in the gospel, to believe in Christ. And, uh, and that's why all human beings, unless God, they are part of the elect. So unless God supernaturally regenerates them first and uh, vivifies them and allows them to uh, repent, and believe in God and have faith, they can't in any way have faith. So the people that are rejecting the gospel, that are rejecting in Christ, that are rejecting God, they're not really doing it because they are choosing to reject him. They're doing it because rejecting God is the only thing that they can do. And this is the problematic connotation of total inability. And that's why it's in a biblical theology. It's an unbiblical doctrine. And, uh, and again, just this verse, seems to contradict this, uh, this, this doctrine, right? It's first hearing, first having your heart open, first believing the word of truth, believing in the gospel, believing in Christ, trusting in him, and then you are regenerated, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, then you are born again. Uh, and again, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. And again, this is the second time that this word appears. Before, remember, it was in verse 11. So the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. And until the redemption, and then again, we have the second time this word appears. You remember, the first time was in verse 7, right? Read the, the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So here again, what is Paul talking about, right? It seems that Paul is talking about being predestined to obtain this inheritance, right? Being predestined to be adopted. Being predestined to... Uh, and like being guaranteed to have this inheritance until this redemption. So once we obtain kind of this redemption of the purchased possession, which is our inheritance, seems that that's it. That's like, that's what we are predestined to, to have. Remember, in neither of this passage, it talks about being predestined to salvation or God choosing us to be saved. Remember, this is not what the text is saying. This is God saying, the, uh, the Apostle Paul saying that God has chosen us in Christ that we should be holy and without blame and has predestined us to be adopted to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. And, uh, and again, it's very important that when we lay out these words, we're not giving definitions, as I said before. Uh, so, yeah, I see the word choosing. Okay, that means God is choosing to salvation. Or when I see predestination, oh, yeah, this means God is predestining to salvation, right? We shouldn't assume that or be very quick to jump at conclusions but we should examine the text and see okay what is paul talking about here and as i said before what i'm going to do right now is i'm going to try to show you what this inheritance is what this redemption is what this possession is what this predestination what this adoption is and what is this election in christ remember this election is actually conditioned of being in christ and let's go here to Romans chapter 8, another chapter that um, 
Calvinists uh, like a lot, especially verses from 29 and 30. Uh, but again, these verses analyzed properly, you can see how they actually destroy Calvinist theology and they contradict how Calvinists interpret the passages, not only such as Vision Swan, but even as such as the uh, approach Romans itself. We're going to take a look here at what, how the Bible defines adoption. So the, when Ephesians 1 says here that we are predestined to adoption, what is it referring to? Well, it says here, Romans 8, from 15 to 17. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Um, and once again here, what is the spirit of adoption? Well, meaning that we are children of God. And this is something that we receive through the spirit that it makes us uh, makes us us like realize that God is truly our father. So God becomes literally like our legal father. And therefore, we are 100% children of God. And therefore, because we are adopted into God's family, like we are legally adopted by God's family, that means that now we are also heirs and of everything that God has. And God possesses everything, right? So we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That is what we are. That is what we receive through this adoption to the Holy Spirit. And, um, and again, here it says, very important, that yes, we are children, we are heirs, we know that we are children of God. But see how Paul uses the fact that we may also be glorified together. So, yes, it's a reality that now we have already received. When we believed, right, we received the spirit of adoption. We refer to God now as our Father. We are children of God. We are heirs, but the glory, so the full, uh, the full realization that we're going to have of these truths, biblical truths, the fact that we are children of God, that we are heirs of God, is a future thing. It's a future glory that will happen. And uh, you don't believe me? Well, just continue reading. Because if you read from verses 18 until 25, it's even more clear. Paul then here says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So again, this glory shall be revealed. It's not yet revealed. It will be revealed. And then he says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So again, we will be revealed fully as sons of God, but in the future, it's something that hasn't happened yet. And then Paul continues, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And again, it's a will be delivered, right? So this glorious liberty of the children of God is something that will happen, hasn't happened yet. We have the assurance through the Spirit, that we have received the Spirit of Adoption, that we are children of God, that we are heirs, but we haven't fully received this glory. It hasn't fully uh, revealed itself, right? And then he says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And then here you can see Paul changes terms. He says, actually, now. Wait, what? But I thought that Paul was referring to a future thing. Why is now Paul talking about the present? And then look here what Paul says. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. And, uh, and now what is Paul here saying? That we, together with creation, are mourning, are groaning. We are in pain, in a sense. We are suffering, right? Because of sin, because of the fact that we are in, under the bondage of corruption, under the bondage of death and sin, but this will not always be the case. There will be a future time where 
we are going to receive what we hope for, right? That's what we are hoping for it. And uh, yes, we have the assurance right now. We have the seal of the Spirit. We have the guarantee of the Spirit. We know that we're children of God. We know that we're hearers. We know that we can talk to God as our Father. But is this glory, this, uh, this full revelation, this full um, liberty, this full manifestation of this fact that we are truly sons of God and that we will look like Jesus, and that's exactly what Paul says afterwards, uh, it's a future thing. It's something that hasn't happened yet. And that's why we are eagerly waiting for what? For the adoption, the redemption of our body. And you can see here the first time, that's why Romans is very helpful to understand this predestination to adoption. Because then it's linked to this redemption of their possession. Linked to inheritance, linked once again right here to predestination. So you can see how it's all a circle that closes itself. And what is the adoption, the full, um, man, the full like, completion of, I don't know how to say it, but the full um, finalization of adoption, what is going to be? The fact that our body is going to be redeemed. We're going to have a future glorified, perfect, resurrected body that's going to look exactly like the one that Jesus had when he resurrected. And this will finally seal the fact that we are now, when we're going to have that body, that spiritual body, that resurrected body, that is going to finally symbolize the fact that we are fully sons of God, that we are fully being revealed as sons of God. This glorious liberty, we're going to be glorified, where we're going to have all these spiritual blessings that come with it. So see here how the Bible interprets and helps us to understand what is referring to. And uh, so you can see how the adoption is actually directly referring to redemption of our body. So the, the idea that we have been predestined to adoption, here what Paul is saying is that we have been predestined us to have that redemption of that glorified body that will finally symbolize the fact that we're fully sons of God. And we're going to have this future glory as sons of God. And this makes total sense because... Later on, it says that this inheritance is also uh, being predestined. And the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of this inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. And this purchased possession is exactly that, is our redempted bodies. What Jesus has bought with his own blood for us. And uh, you can see how everything just explains itself. And we don't even need to go that uh, far, you know, or to add meanings to words or to create dichotomies and, and so forth. And look here how Paul concludes this passage. He says here, for we were saved in this hope. So you can see here that we are already saved. We are already saved, but awaiting, eagerly awaiting for this hope. And this hope is that, is to be fully adopted, is to have the full revealing of the sons of God, the full glorious liberty of the sons of God, this glory which shall be revealed in us. This is what we are hoping for, but we are already saved. So this, you can see how all this is helping us to understand that this predestination actually is something that happens after salvation. So what the Bible is telling us is that this predestination, so this thing that God has predestined before the foundation of the world that happens when he chose us in Christ is what happens after we are saved. So after we have already, as the verse 15 says, we have already heard and believed and trusted in Christ. This is what happens afterwards. So this predestination is for after salvation, not before. It's not a predestination to salvation, as Calvinists say, but it's a predestination to what happens after you're saved. So see here the difference? And I hope that with these verses, I was able to show you why this is the case. And this is a, a, is a more coherent understanding of the text and using scripture to interpret scripture. And here, I'm just taking Romans 8. There are a ton of other passages I'm going to show you later on that uh, help us to understand this even more. And then Paul says, For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is in hope. For why does one still hope what this is? 
So here Paul is asking you know, a rhetorical question. Then Paul says, but if we hope for what we do not see, the fact that we haven't been fully adopted yet, we haven't received this redemption of our body, this glory, this glorious liberty, right? We haven't received that yet. We're hoping for it. So that why, that's why Paul says, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. And, uh, and this makes perfect sense. And that's why if you keep reading, then we come to verses uh, 28, 29, and 30. And we now have a more clear understanding of what Paul is referring to. When Paul is talking about adoption, he's talking about the redemption of our body, he's talking about our future glorious liberty, the fact that we're children of God, and so we're going to have that redemption, right? Uh, he's talking about that event. So it's something that he's talking after we are saved. So it can't be, like Paul, Paul can't be talking here about something that happens after we're saved, and then in the verses right afterwards, Paul talks about what happens before we're saved. It makes no sense. And that's why verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called, who are decalled according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to what? To be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And again here, this makes perfect sense. If we have fully understood that Paul is talking here about the future glory, our redempted, glorified spiritual bodies that we're going to have, and this denotes pretty much the fullness of the revelation of the adoption that we are truly sons of God, and this is the glory that we're going to have, then this is something that God has actually predestined us to be. God has already established that those who would be saved, that those who would trust in Christ, that those who would believe in Him, in His Son, that they would be guaranteed this redemptive body, this glorious liberty, this uh, adoption into His family. This is something that God has already established before anything else. And this is something that God has uh, decreed, you know, to use a Calvinist terms, um, God has decreed that this happens, that everyone who is saved will be conformed to the image of His Son. And again, this is completely um, linear and coherent with all the previous verses and what Paul is talking about. As I said before, it would make no sense that Paul is talking here about a future event, something that hasn't happened yet, and that's why we are hoping for it. And then Paul reverts and talks about something that happens before that, right? It would make no sense. And that's what then Paul continues. And he says, moreover, whom he predestined, this he also called. Whom he, also, whom he called, this he also justified. In whom he justified, this he also glorified. And you can see how these are all terms that are um, written in the past. So it's something that God has already done because God, of course, is out of time, right? God is outside time. So these are all things because of his foreknowledge, because of his omniscience. God knows who are going to be the ones that are going to trust in Christ and those who will not. And God has already established that those who will trust in Christ, those who will be saved, then those are going to be predestined to this future glory, to this redemptive body, to be fully adopted and to receive this inheritance. And, uh, and these are all things that God has done because these are also the people that God calls because God calls those who respond to him. God calls and those who respond, uh, you know, they uh, get to walk into the, the call that God has for them, into the purpose that God has for them. And, uh, and again, those who are called, so those who respond positively, those who believe are also justified because again we're justified by faith and not by works and again those who are justified are also glorified because these are all things that god has established that will happen and you can see all these things are actually consequences of faith we are glorified because of our faith we are justified because of our faith we are called because of our faith and we are predestined because of our faith so all these things happen after the fact when we believe in christ when we accept him, when we decide to believe the truth and we receive the son and we do not reject him. And again, this is something, is an ability, as I said before, that God has granted to all people. Anyone can come, repent, and believe in God. Anyone can. It's not like God has blinded some people, God has prevented uh, humanity to be able to do that. If some people do not come to God is not because like the Holy Spirit hasn't enabled them 
or they are hemorrhagic or they are not part of the elect. Very simply because they are suppressing the truth, as Romans 1 says, and rather than acknowledging God and coming to him, they are suppressing the truth and they are following lies. They are following their own wicked minds and they are rejecting God. And that's why they are responsible for that suppressing the truth, for that rejection of God. Because they could be saved. They could believe in God, but they decide not to. They chose not to. And that's why they are responsible. That's why there are consequences. Uh, and this is just uh, the passage on Romans. Let me read here a passage from Corinthians chapter 15, which once again is very, very um, uh, awesome. And it talks solely about this future glory, this future glorified body that we're going to have and how this is all linked to our future glory, to our the fact that we're fully adopted, we're fully like Jesus, and that we are incorruptible, we're going to be eternal, and so forth. Look here. Verse, four, uh, verse 42 it says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in natural body, it is raised in spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. And again here, see how similar this verse is to uh, Romans 8, right here, conform to the image of his son. And then here it says, so bear the image of the heavenly man. So you can see why this is actually talking about our redempted, glorified bodies. It's talking about our spiritual bodies. Being conformed to the image of the son means this. It doesn't mean to be saved. It doesn't mean to have the, the embodiment of righteousness, as I heard some uh, a Calvary say, that being conformed to the image of the Son means salvation, because this means to be the embodiment of righteousness, so the fact that God has justified us. Uh, doesn't, doesn't mean like that. We don't have to add layers and make it very difficult, other than what the text is actually saying. Conformed to the image of the Son means that we are going to be exactly like he was. The, the image of God, the image of Jesus resurrected, that's our image. That's how we're going to be like. And that's it. That's like very, very simple. We don't need to do like a lot of uh, things here uh, to, to add meanings you know, to the text. And again, Corinthians here allows us to fully understand that this is what is going to happen. And this is referring to the heavenly, uh, to the heavenly, to spiritual body that we're going to have. Of course, I'm not denying that uh, together with the spiritual resurrected uh, body, right, perfect body, glorified body, we're going to have we're going to resemble Jesus in many other things, right? We're not going to sin anymore. We're going to have our inheritance. We're going to have uh, many, many, like the Bible says, every spiritual blessing is in Christ. So we're going to have all of that together. And then verse 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I told you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and they, we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, what is your sting? O Hades, what is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And again, I just wanted to include these last verses, even though no, they are not really um, so pertinent to, the, to what we're talking about. But again, look here how Paul is just... Uh, pretty much just summarizing what will happen, right? The fact that uh, the dead right, will be raised incorruptible 
and we shall be changed. So we who are gonna be alive, right, we're gonna be changed. Instead, the people that are already dead, they're gonna be raised with these glorified bodies. And, um, and again, no corruptible, this corrupted body putting on incorruption. This moral body affected by sin, affected by death, putting now immortality. And, uh, and now death is swallowed up. Death is overcome. You know, death, he said in the Bible, is the last enemy that is going to be defeated uh, in a Revelation. And, um, and yeah, the victory here is through our Lord Jesus Christ. So yeah, that's the passages I wanted to, uh, to read a bit more, you know, that a bit more, um, that allows us to understand a bit more, you know, this context of the spiritual body, this redemption of body, this full adoption, and this predestination. God has predestined all those who believe in Christ, so therefore all those who are saved are going to guaranteed to have this redemptive, glorified body, this glorious, every spiritual blessing that comes with being in Christ, and all the things that come with it. Um, so again, it's uh, predestination to this, right? To this glory that we're going to have. So it's something that happens after we already believe in Christ. We're already un united with Christ and therefore we are saved. Then let's read some more passages. Here I'm going to have different passages that talk about, like again, adoption, that talk about um, being holy and blipness, uh, that talk about uh, inheritance uh, and so forth. Now Colossians chapter 1 says here, and you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature in the heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So I can see here two things. First of all, the fact that it's possible to be moved away from the hope of the gospel. So... Again, according to Calvinism, the elect can't be unsaved. So the elect will inevitably will say will be saved. The elect can't be moved away. Uh, the elect will never reject Christ. Right? They might have periods when they become maybe you know less. Uh, um, uh, they get distant from God, or maybe they are kind of spiritually um, uh, like asleep, asleep, right? But they will never re reject. Christ, you know, because they are saved, and so uh, they are elect, so they can't be saved in any way. This is the first thing that it looks here, that we can actually be moved away from the hope of the gospel. Uh, so we have to continue in the faith. We have to be grounded and steadfast, and that's something that we have to do, you know. Um, and uh, and again, this present you holy and blameless and above reproach is actually, again, something in the future, right? It's referring to where we are going to be in front of God, and God is going to... Uh, you know, judge all the works and all the things that we did. And this is where we're going to be completely holy, blameless, and above reproach. You know, until then, we're not. We're not completely holy, we're not completely blameless, and we're not completely above reproach. We are sinners, and we need God's grace and mercy and forgiveness each day. Uh, but the idea is that through Jesus, right, in Christ, we will be this. Not because of our works, but because of His work, because of the fact that right, the righteousness, the holiness of Christ is imputed to us. And again, this is just to show you that when it says here, just as he chose us in him, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, it's again talking about a future event. It's like a, talking about when we're going to stand in front of God, that God is going to judge our works. It's not like a judging for uh, condemnation. It's going to be a judging for the works uh, and uh, for the rewards, you know. So, yeah, again, so you can see how this choosing, yes, it's something that God has done in Christ before the foundation of the world, but this is something that God has established, you know, and it happens, and this is something that happens after we believe already. So, again, it's just to show you uh, that link. Uh, second thing here, John uh, chapter 1, verse 10 to 13. He was, so he is the word, so it's Jesus. He was in the word, and the word was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, so to the Jews, to Israel, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, this is again a very common passage that sometimes Calvinists twist, and they change the order of things. It's like 
the elect, so those that God has already given the right to become children of God, those are the ones that are regenerated. Therefore, those are the ones that are enabled to receive Christ. Those are the ones that are enabled to believe in his name. And therefore, those are the ones that you know are regenerated because it's a supernatural thing that God does that is not depending, not even on the will of man. So it's not something that I do with my will. So it's not like I decide to believe and therefore I'm born again, right? That's how Calvinists interpret this passage. But you can see this is not what the passage says. Uh, having in mind all the things that we discussed, you can see that it's actually the opposite. It's the fact that those that receive him, those who believe in his name, to them he gives the right to become children of God. So it's the opposite. It's first receiving God. It's first receiving Christ and believing in his name. And then God gives you the right to become children of God. And of course, this is adoption. Right? To become children of God, that's another word for adoption, to be adopted. Again, same word that we have seen in Ephesians chapter 3 and in Romans 8 and in 1 Corinthians. Uh, and again, in this fact, so the fact that we become children of God, this is something that God has established. So it's not like the fact that I believe in Christ, now I am the one that has to make myself to become part of God's family, right? Or I'm the one that has to do something to be adopted or has to do something to be saved. It doesn't work like that. God has already done everything. It's all according to his sovereign plan and his sovereign choice to say, to save whatsoever is going to receive Christ and believe in his name. And this is something that God does. So it is God that adopts me. It is God that gives me the right to become his, his uh, children, right? It is God that does this. It's not, it doesn't come from my will. I can't make myself to become a children of God. It is God that does it when I receive him, when I believe in Christ. So you can see how the condition to be children of God and the condition to be born again is actually receiving uh, Christ, it's like having faith in Christ. That's the condition that allows you to be regenerated and allows you to become children of God, not the other way around, as Calvinists uh, suggest. Another one, Galatians 3, 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So again, it's faith that makes us sons of God. It's not like we are elect and therefore we are already, in a sense, sons of God, even before uh, we are regenerated, before we have faith, before we are saved. So it's faith that makes us sons of God. Again, this is all in line with what we have uh, seen. Galatians 4, 5-7 says, To redeem those who were under the law, that they that we might receive the adoption as sons. So again, we are redeemed. Remember this word, to be bought again, uh, so that we can receive the adoption as sons. We can become sons. Again, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then a heir of God through Christ. This is very similar to what Romans 8 uh, said. You know? And again, you can see how the spirit is actually sent into our hearts after we are sons. So after we believe. Remember, it's a process. Having faith, give, being given the right by God to be born again and to be adopted and to become sons of God. And then we have the Holy Spirit that is poured into our hearts. If you look at the Calvinist, it's the other way around. First, it's being regenerated by the Spirit. Then you believe and then you no, are saved in a sense, but you were already saved because you are an elect. Um, so you can see how the Calvinist just switches the, the order. It's first the spirit that regenerates you, and then you can believe or you are enabled to, to believe, and then to be, you know, to be saved and to be adopted. But for the Bible, it's actually the opposite. First you believe, then you become a, adopted, you become a son of God, and then you receive the Holy Spirit, exactly as Ephesians 1 says right here in verse 13. And 14. You can see how if we do not follow the Calvinist framework, it all makes sense. It's all coherent. We don't have to resort to using double meanings, right? To say, yeah, there is an adoption of one sense, there is an adoption of another sense, or there is, uh, when here the Bible talks about the spirit in our hearts, is referring to an action that is not the regeneration, though. So the regeneration is not the spirit coming to our hearts, it's something different. So they keep adding layers, they keep adding meanings to words, 
uh, when instead there is not such a such a thing in the scriptures. They have to start like dichotomizing faith, right? There is the common faith and there is the salvific faith. There is the common grace and there is the specific grace. There is the hidden will of God and there is the real will of God. Those those are all things that Calvinists have to do in order to make verses such as this one that seem to contradict their theology to fit their theology. And again, remember that's something that is very dangerous and um, yeah, we should we should not do. Uh, another verse here in Ephesians chapter three, not just to not read uh, everything, but is the fact that um, the even Paul says we not that I have already attained it or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. So it's a future thing, right? Uh, and um, and again, it's uh, yes, it's something that even now we have the assurance of we have the Holy Spirit testifying to our spirits that yes we're saved yes we're children of god yes we're adopted yes we are heirs as we read before right we are heirs of god through christ uh we are going to receive the inheritance we're going to receive the adoption we're going to receive our future glory but these things have yet to fully be revealed and to fully happen uh and um and yeah so again uh, the, the idea is to you know keep pressing on and uh the fact that we're not yet perfected so it's a future Thing, right it's not something that has already happened but that has to happen and then I have some more here Colossians 3 23 24 says and whatever you do do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ and again the inheritance is what we get from being in union with Christ so whatever we do for the Lord right and not to man from the Lord itself we're gonna receive the reward and again uh, there is actually a difference between the inheritance and the reward the inheritance like the spiritual blessings all the things that were guaranteed because god has put all these blessings in christ instead the rewards when the bible talks about the rewards are those things that god is going to give to each individual believer depending on the the labor that they did the works that they did and um and all the things that they did during the lifetime for his kingdom for god's glory uh Obe being obedient to God and so forth and depending on uh, each believer you know, each believer some believers might have more rewards some might have less they're all going to receive the full inheritance because they were going to be saved you know they're going to be welcomed they're going to be adopted glorified but to each is going to be given different rewards depending on the the works that they did in uh, Jesus name and also for uh, the will of God and for the glory of God then there is also this passage in Ephesians chapter 1. Again, if we just continue reading here from verse 17 onwards, um, it says here that the uh, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance, again, this word that are here, in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And again, this is something that uh, you know, we uh, should ask you know, for God, you know, should be renewed by in our mind. And also we might have wisdom and revelation, increase our knowledge of God, and of Jesus Christ, and having our understanding being enlightened. You know, sometimes, um, you know, when we have a certain framework, theological framework, it's like we are limited in our understanding because we read these verses and we always interpret it in the same way. We always limit somehow what the, what the scripture could teach us. So it's very important that our eyes are enlightened so that we can see the full truth and the full picture of God's wisdom and we don't sometimes put limits to what God can and can't do. Because you see many times the Calvinist like, is accusing, uh, accusing like non-Calvinists that, yeah, you are trying to limit God, you're trying to limit God's sovereignty uh, and so forth. But in reality, it is them that is, they're trying to limit God. It's like God cannot choose to give us free will and to make salvation available to all. It's like God somehow is incapable of doing that. But of course, that's just false, you know, and that's putting a limit on God. It's like God 
cannot give us free will and at the same time be sovereign enough that he can work all things according to his will. Uh, but of course, God can do that. And uh, Romans 9 is an example of how God did that uh, regarding you know, Jesus. So using Israel, you know, disobedience and rejection to accomplish his purpose and his salvation to all uh, the world. Uh, and again, so that we may know also the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Again, this future glory, our full adoption, the full revelation of us, sons of God, the redemption of our bodies, you know, having this spiritual, perfect, eternal, glorified body, uh, like Jesus had been conformed to his image and, you know, receiving every spiritual blessing that comes with it and with being in union with Christ. Uh, and then some more verses here. Uh, Ephesians 5.5 5 says, For this you know, uh, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is in love has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So this is a negative um, connotation, right? That all those who persist, you know, that are fornicators, that are unclean, that are covetous, and that do not repent, or they, like, they're not submitting themselves to God, but they're doing these things somehow, you know, freely, and thinking, yeah, there will be no consequences, I can do this and still, you know, believe in God or whatever, that instead, these people, uh, such people, do not have any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Again, remember, uh, we are not perfect. Every Christian sins, every Christian falls, every Christian fails, and uh, that's not the case. So that it's not like we have to be perfect. But the, uh, the idea is that we walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. So that means that, yes, we might sin, but the, the goal is to sin less and less the more we keep in our walk with Christ. And uh, we, uh, we always repent, we always ask God for forgiveness, you know, and we do not think that we are good already or that, you know, uh, God has already forgiven me so I can do whatever I want, you know, having that kind of uh, wrong approach to God's grace and like thinking that God's grace means that, yeah, I can never lose my salvation or I can never, I can do whatever I want. Uh, yeah, that's not what the Bible teaches. And then Matthew uh, chapter 7, again, a negative example, in this case given by Jesus. And Jesus says, uh, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Uh, and again, this is something that we should all be very careful, especially verse 22, because sometimes we feel like, okay, because I'm doing things in God's name or in Jesus' name, and I'm actually accomplishing things, you know, I might be prophesying, I might be casting out demons, I might be doing mighty wonders and works and miracles, that somehow, you know, the fact that I'm able to do this, that means that I'm fine with God and that God approves of me. Uh, but remember, it's very important that we always put the will of God in the first place. Not our will, but His will. We always do it for His glory, not really for our own gain or uh, power or authority or whatever. We we'll always do it for, for God. Not really looking for um, receiving the appraise of the glory of man, but to receive the praise and the approval of God. Um, and, um, and again, it's very important to be known by God. You know, not merely saying, yeah, I know Jesus, I know God, you know, but that he says to us, I know you. So that's the, that's the most important thing. And, um, and again, here are some other verses, Galatians 5.5, 5, for we through the Spirit eagerly wait, waiting for the hope of righteousness by faith. Again, the means of obtaining this is by faith, the hope, future thing that we haven't got it yet. Again, it's also righteousness. So the full uh, revelation or uh, revealing of the righteousness that we're going to have is something that hasn't happened yet, right? So again, all these things relate to the future, to this future glory that we're going to have. But all these things relate to what happens after we already believe because faith is the means through which we obtain these things, right? So that means that we already have had faith. And, um, and again, Colossians 1.12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And that's pretty much it. Now, this verse from before, uh, Matthew 5, actually made me remind um, of a verse in Corinthians, I think it's 12. For Corinthians 12. Uh, wait, wait a second here. 
Um, yeah, here we go. Oh, 13, 13, sorry. Yeah, not 12, but 13. When he talks about love. Yeah, the greatest gift. And, um, and here, uh, Paul says, uh, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see in a mirror, dimly. But then, face to face. Here, Paul is talking where we're going to be fully revealed as sons of God. You know? And he says, now, I know in part. But then, I shall know just as I am also known. And this is the most important thing, you know? Not just us expecting to fully know God, but also to be fully known by Him. And so to be approved by Him. That's the most important thing that we should be always looking in our, in our lives. And, uh, and that's it, guys. That's the uh, episode I wanted to make. I know it was kind of long, but I wanted to really unpack uh, all as many things as I could. So I hope you enjoyed. God bless you. And see ya. Bye-bye.